Welcome to Hey It's Carly Ray's Book Club. This is book hour where authors will talk their latest novels, reveal their writing process, and play some fun book games. I'm your host, Carly Ray. Today, we have New York Times bestselling authors, Melissa De La Cruz and Margaret Stoll. We're gonna be talking about their novel, Joe and Lori, what it was like working together to create this romantic retelling based off Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, finding out if they are planning to write another book together, as well as see how well they know each other. We'll dive in right after this. Hello, Melissa and Margaret. I'm excited to have you both here. Tell us where you're joining us from. Hi, I'm Mel and I'm uh, tuning in from West Hollywood, California. And I'm across town. I'm Margaret in Santa Monica, but with LA traffic normally, that's like being in a different state. <laughs> now your newest novel, Joe and Lori, is a romantic retelling of Little Women. Here's a close up of the cover. Melissa, tell us about this novel and what those who haven't read it can expect. Uh, the novel Joe and Lori uh, reimagines that Joe March actually wrote Little Women. And Little Women, as it was originally published, was two novels. Uh, Little Women, which ends with uh, Dad March coming home, um, you know, and uh, Meg being engaged and Good Wives, which kind of starts up right after that. Um, so so in our book, Jo has just finished Little Women and she now needs to write the sequel because Little Women became such a huge hit. So it's a little bit of a, you know, kind of like a Wicked Witches of Oz, you know, kind of retelling of Little Women where it's the real story behind the story. Now, Margaret, did you find it challenging reimagining one of literature's most well-known stories, crafting the characters into an almost extended story? Uh, it was challenging, but it was taking on that challenge was the whole point of writing the book. We love Little Women. We wanted to be Joe March when we were little. That is how we imagined our career as writers. So it was really, um, the whole point was getting to like get in their world and sort of feel what it would feel like to be one of those sisters. Yeah. Now many people are divided if they are a Joe and Lori fan or Joe and Professor Bear fan. Melissa, I'm assuming you were always a Joe and Lori fan. Was this romantic retelling something that was in your head for a while? Oh yes. I would say ever since I was 11 years old, and Joe turns down Lori, and I was like heartbroken, you know, as heartbroken as Lori when she turns him down. Why, Joe, why? <laughs> and I tried to accept Professor Bauer like for 30 years. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to write the book that I want to read. <laughs> <laughs> now, Margaret, did you find it hard writing a historical piece and getting all those details correct? Um, again, Yes, but I had I was uh, I went to a PhD program in 19th century American literature, which is basically the period that the book's written in. So um, I knew I could do it, and that I'm I'm like a giant history nerd, so that was part of the fun. Like I wanted to I wanted to do that, and it was it it was as fun as I thought it would be. Yeah. Now, if you could pick one thing that was the most challenging in writing this romantic retelling of Little Women, Melissa, what would it be? The most challenging. I'm right here. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny because when we decided to do this book together, um, our friends and our husbands were a little bit worried. They said, you know, will this friendship survive writing together? Um, because it's, it's hard to write with somebody. You know, writing is so personal and you know usually a solitary uh 
endeavor. Um, so, you know, but I don't think that our fights over the manuscript were, were challenging, I mean, even though they were, you know, there were a lot of all caps texts raging between us over certain scenes, um, which we don't even remember. I mean, if you ask me what we fought about, I sort of, sort of remember, but not really, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I think the challenge, you know, is the pressure to get it right, you know, because we love the book so much and we wanted to make sure that people who love the book would would read and see that. And I think what I really loved was uh, when Margie wrote the first chapter, I felt like I was back in that world. I was so excited. So then I thought, OK, I think we can do this. Now, Margaret, in your podcast interview with Booked All Night, you said Alcott set up the perfect romance in the first half, A Little Women, between Joe and Lori, then nuked it in the second half. Have you gotten to the mystery of why Alcott crafted Joe and Lori that way? And do you feel like your retelling with Melissa will satisfy those diehard Joe and Lori fans? Great question. I um, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously, we'll, we'll all never know why any, any author does what what they do, but I've always seen it as a genre pivot where um, where an author who is not yet the most famous female author in America and maybe the world in her day, um, is where, the, where an author's working really hard to get it right. And that's what I feel like that was like, Alcott was trying to deliver, there was a lot on the line, no one was sure it would succeed or publisher wanted her to do it and actually promised her father could publish a book if she did it. Like it was a real like working gig. Yeah. And, uh, and it represented a departure from what she'd normally done. So I had this real sense that she was obeying genre rules and trying to get it right. And then the book came out, it instantly sold 2000 copies. She became a rock star. And then she was like, screw it. I'm gonna do whatever I want. I'm not gonna do anything the readers want me to do. And everyone is standing Joe and Lori and it's becoming like a huge thing. She's like, nope, not giving that to you. So I totally, and that's my like, based on reading 10,000 letters of hers. But I, uh, I I absolutely get that because I've seen Mel do it and I've done it. And our friend Veronica became infamous for doing it in Divergent. And there's some sense in which like, there's always sort of the competing pressure of like, what's your art and what's your job? You know what I mean? And, and you're always sort of working on that and finding a different answer. So I don't know if that's the right answer to the question, but yeah. that's what I got. <laughs> you heard Melissa and Margaret talk about Joe and Lori, a romantic retelling. When we come back, we're gonna be diving deeper into their writing process and find out if we can expect another collaboration soon. Thank you for choosing Three Brothers Wineries. I'm Erica Palacelli. I'm one of the partners here at the winery, and I want to tell you a little bit more about our estate. We were founded in 2006 by Dave and Luann Mansfield. We have 40 acres of grapevines, a fully operational farm. All of the wines you're tasting today are from our farm. We have two female winemakers, Kim Marconi and Paige Vinson. On our campus, we actually have three wineries and a microbrewery. We have an extensive portfolio of not only wine, but also beer, hard cider, wine spritzers, and wine slushy, all manufactured here on site. When we opened our doors in 2007, we had a modest staff of 10. We've grown to employ 40 full-time and 100 part-time employees. We pride ourselves on creativity, innovation, and our company culture. When you make a purchase from Three Brothers Wineries or Warhorse Brewing, you're supporting a majority women-owned small business, and we thank you for that. Welcome back to Book Hour. I'm your host, Carly Ray, here with Melissa De La Cruz and Margaret Stoll. Now, many people may not know this, but Melissa, you are all about getting the outline done for Joe and Lori, and Margaret, you are all about the tone. Melissa, did you just do the outline and Margaret did the writing? Tell us why the outline. Uh, I'm an outliner. Um, I think I kind of structure stories that way. And I like to kind of like have um, the whole book, you know, in a skeletal structure. Um, and, uh, you know, Margie was, you know, the person who was like, let's get the voice right. Let's get the tone right. Um, and, uh, you know, Margie wrote the first half of the book, I wrote the second half, and then we kind of traded. 
So that's how we work together. And now, you know, I don't know who wrote what, except I know Margie wrote the first chapter. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> now, Margaret, wh why the tone for you? I think because it's time travel on a really sort of cellular level, you know, like if you are going to go to a different time in a book, like it's the words that are gonna get you there. And in the 19th century, there were really specifically, you know, specific sentence constructions we don't have and voices didn't sound the same because we didn't speak the same. So um, that was really important to me. And, and that's when you really know you're writing a book 100% for yourselves, right? So like, we always care about our readers and we wanted to share this with our readers, but 100% I wanted to see if we could do it. Yeah. And the, so to me, the tricky alchemy, the magic part of it was like, could we, could we get, you know, the voice, could we get the voice and, and the sort of the time travel part of it, right? Now, did you guys like, I know you wrote like the first half. So did you guys like have an outline of the whole book? And then Margaret, you went through and you did the first half and then Melissa, you kind of took over. Like, how did you mesh your styles? Yeah, I think it's mushier than that. Um, I think I was feeling my way through the beginning. So I think I just mm -hmm. like, like, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, jammed with that. Yeah. And then Mel is very structural and was like, here's what I see. and. And also Mel had been, this was her idea. I mean, Mel had been working on this in her head for a long time. So I think she also had a lot of thinking about like, what story would you do in parallel to the story that existed, the degree to which it was just like worshipful fan service from us mm -hmm. in a certain way. Yeah. And I'm now, sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Melissa, you have written numerous novels in your career, all of various genres. Tell us, how do you keep track of all of your novels? Do you have to go to a special place for inspiration? And also how many, what are we at now? I counted 63. Um, I don't know if that includes like this year. Like, I don't know where I stopped counting, but I know it was 63 at one point. Um, yeah, yeah no, right. I have a little, <laughs> I mean, I have my little notes, you know, my notes app and I write down, you know, uh, the various projects and, you know, the various due dates. Um, I don't go anywhere to get inspired, really. I just kind of work. Um, I think I, I, you know, I, I think this is the way I deal with writer's block. It's like I work on a lot of different things. And, you know, so I write in middle grade and then kind of to do a palate cleanser. I did an adult novel, you know, and then I'm like, oh, I want to write romance again. I'll do YA, you know, so it was fun to have a project with Margie because I was like, that's the Margie you know, Joe and Lori project. Um, so everything is very different, you know, um, and, uh, and, you know, even in tone and the story um, and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I guess I just like being busy, you know, and people will come and say, oh, will, will you do this audio book and I'll, or will you do this graphic novel? And I'll be like, all right, you know, um, just to see if I can do that, if that's interesting. Um, and, uh, and as long as it's fun. Yeah. So you're able to jump around between books uh, in the early parts. Yes. Yeah. But once they get into, you know, the really kind of like um, the two week and, you know, I kind of have to concentrate on one certain book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Margaret, you are most well known for writing beautiful creatures with Cami Garcia. What was it like for you collaborating with another author on a totally different novel? You know, I collaborate all the time it turns out. I've thought a lot about this because writers are so different and they they all work so differently. And Mel and I work so differently, which was one of the reasons it worked. But I started in the game industry. I started as a screenwriter and collaborated with our friend Pseudonymous Bosch. Then I, I worked on games. I had a game studio for 16 years or 18 years where like I would work with a hundred people on a project. So um, most recently I just worked in a, uh, I work in with Marvel where you're collaborating with an editor, an artist, a letterer, a colorist, right? Yeah. So I, I have realized I'm the kind of person who likes to get somewhere I couldn't get by myself. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I like working with different brains, um, who, who can challenge me and like up my game sort of. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I uh, it, 
I, I'm, I'm used to collaborating. It was really different to collaborate with Mel because when I collaborated with Cami, I had nothing to compare it to. Like that was my entrance into the book world and we knew nothing. We were just like babies. <laughs> so it was kind of fun at this point in my career, like 15 or 16 books later, because I have not written 60 books, but to be like, I know what I do. I know what I'm like. I know how I write books. I know how Mel writes books and to kind of see how that fit together. In fact, it was like so different. It's sort of crazy, Yeah, but fun. Yeah. Yeah. We had a cameo on a few weeks ago and she's DC comics now and you're Marvel comics. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cammy, well, you know what, actually one thing that's super interesting is both Cammy and Mel in that situation are like, the firecracker and I react to that. But both of them are definitely like, like the sort of alpha, like we will get this done. Mark, do your work, we have to get this done. Like I probably never would have become a writer if Cami hadn't been like a teacher who was like, give me your stuff, where's your stuff? <laughs> it's left on my own. I like get sort of like, like a lost absent-minded professor and I would be wandering around my house coming up with different lines. So it's so good for me to have a Mel or a Cami in that scenario. Yeah. Now, one thing I'm curious about, Melissa, is if you have a favorite book or series that you've written out of all of your 60-something novels. Um, I, You know, I don't know if I have a favorite, but I always love the ones that nobody else loves. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always love the, the failures a little bit. Because I, you know, kind of put the same amount of work into all of my books, and some of them do really well, and some of them not so well. So I always love um, ringing the ring in the crown, uh, which did not do very well, but I loved it. And I always love Wolfpack, which uh, we didn't even publish as a book. It came out as a, I think it just came out as a digital ebook in the states. It came out as a real book in the UK. You know, but uh, but it wasn't published in print here, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's sad. So I kind of love those kind of books that nobody nobody else really read. <laughs> oh, but that's like different kinds of success. I mean, mm -hmm. I think about that all the time. Like yeah. having a million people buy your book is is a great kind of success, but you also can get like these passionate letters about your least popular book and. No, it was probably like more important in a certain crowd than than your most popular book. Now, Margaret, do you have an all time favorite that you've been a part of? Well, so similar to Mel, <laughs> my first book that didn't hit the list was called Icons. It was a style I loved, <laughs> and I think it's my favorite book to this day. And and I get tormented letters, for, you know, from those readers because uh, that was really. I wrote that book in a kind of depressive spiral. I sort of wrote it in my bathtub. And, um, and the people who connect to that book are my people. So like, I, really, uh, I really get them. But, but Beautiful Creatures had the, the magic of the first, which is a real thing. The moment you learn you can write a book. Yeah. So that will always be like a very special baby in that sense. Well, you just found out what Melissa and Margaret's favorite books they've written are. Stay tuned because when we come back, we're going to see how well these two know each other. <laughs> mm, coffee. The liquid that helps us start our day or keeps us going at 2 p.m. when our keyboard pillow nap comes calling. At Fire Department Coffee, we know how important it is to you that your coffee tastes great. Because let's face it, when you're choking down 8 to 10 cups of bean juice a day running back-to-back -back calls, or just trying to keep your wits together while your well-behaved children tug at every last strand of your sanity, we want to make sure that every last drop in your mug is the best coffee you've ever tasted. Who are you talking to? That's why at Fire Department Coffee, every stage of your order is watched after by carefully trained professional eyes like our head roaster, retired fire captain, Dave McWhit. <laughs> Dave! From our R&D department that's always striving to make sure that your next cup of Fire Department Coffee is the perfect balance of wonderful taste and the caffeinated motivation that you need to get through your day. There has got to be a better way of testing this. Probably making sure that you get your orders delivered to you as quickly and affordably as possible. Hey Doris, you know you're the only lady I hand deliver to. Oh, thank you Jason. I was wondering if you could help me. I think my cat is stuck in the attic again. Are you sure he's up here Doris? 
It's really hot. I can't see anything. Oh, I'm sure he's still up there. Uh, why don't you take off your shirt? You wouldn't want to overheat. Ha, <laughs> not falling again for that, Doris. And at the end of the day, we're just thankful that we get to follow our passion of making high quality coffee for thousands of hardworking people all across the world. So thank you for your support. And we look forward to making each and every one of your days better. One cup of coffee at a time. Cut. Woo. Good job, guys. Very, very nice. Smooth. A lady named Doris just ordered a couple bags of coffee and asked for it to be delivered by her steamy ginger firefighter. Oh, that lady is relentless. Welcome back to book hour. It is game time, Melissa and Margaret. We are gonna see how well you two know each other. I'm gonna ask you questions about each other and we're gonna see if you can answer them correctly. <laughs> so the first up is Melissa. Um, tell us what Margaret's favorite color is. Her favorite color? <laughs> Black. <laughs> was that right, Margaret? <laughs> Black is certainly the only color I wear. So, that's what I went with. <laughs> now, Margaret, what is Melissa's favorite book of all time? Uh, she loves War and Peace. She's a Tolstoy girl. She loves Lord of the Rings. It's another big, you know, one of the ones. There's different ones she wishes she'd written, I think. <laughs> but I think, I think Tolstoy is your favorite of all time. Um, that's amazing because I forgot that that is my favorite book. I'm like, oh my God, Margie listens. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I really do. Oh, no. a long time now. <laughs> Melissa, what is Margaret's favorite place to visit? Oh, um, Italy uh, or, or Toronto. <laughs> yeah. uh, Margaret, what is Melissa's favorite movie? Hmm. Oh, you know this. It's also Stillman's favorite movie. I don't know. Oh, oh. Um, well, here's what you share with Stillman is mm. is um, what you call it. Moulin Rouge is one that's of those. That's it. <laughs> but I don't know that that's really your favorite. Well, because like think about how much you've talked about Dune, for example, in the last. But not. But Dune is not my favorite movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, good. Melissa, what month was Margaret born? Uh, November. <laughs> and then Margaret, if Melissa could pick one superpower, what would it be? Hmm. She already has superpowers. I don't know if she'd want a different one. <laughs> you know, she would like to have Hermione's time turner. I'm pretty sure about that because she has 75 thousand things to do every day. Yeah. Does that count? Is that what I said? I kind of remember answering that in an interview, right? More time. <laughs> time Turner. Yeah. yeah. Now, Melissa, is Margaret a tea or coffee drinker? Oh, coffee. 100%. <laughs> Runs in my hand. Cut me. My blood is brown. <laughs> and then, Margaret, what is Melissa afraid of most? Hmm. Um, afraid of, I think she's like, well, that's a good question. You're not really afraid of that many things. You get a little bit, you would be afraid of anything happening to your family, like your kid, mm -hmm. your mom or there, there. I think that's like the thing that, that's the only thing that I've ever seen really unsettle you would be any perceived, yeah. you know, yeah. thing that your child had to deal with. Definitely. Aside from that, I mean, you're kind of fearless, really. I'm scared of fire. <laughs> I but think, yeah, I think kidnapping, that was always my biggest fear, remember? <laughs> and I think you worry sometimes about the well running dry, like that whole thing of just like, mm -hmm. like, can, like getting burned out. We talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Like sticking it all to the end. Well, I have to say you two do know each other. So we're going to move on and play a game of would you ever. So first up, Melissa, would you ever act in a movie? No, no. <laughs> I mean, even as an extra, 
I'm, it's fine. I don't have to be on camera. <laughs> it's not my favorite thing. <laughs> Mario, Mel is like a Vogue fashionista. So like, imagine her being like given, you know, like a sweater to wear and she would be like, mm -mm, no, this isn't going on camera. <laughs> also the angles, I'd have to Barbara Streisand the whole thing. You know? <laughs> it's like only shoot me from here in the soft light. And <laughs> <laughs> now, Margaret, would you ever go on a safari? Yes. Have you ever gone on a safari? No, but <laughs> my, my brother just did and loved it. And I love, I like to take pictures. I like nature. So yeah. I, I thought I would love it. Send me, please. <laughs> oh, readers on a safari. Melissa, would you ever swim in the ocean at night? Hmm, I think I, uh, Yes, but I, I don't like it cold. Yeah. You know? So if it's cold, I probably wouldn't. But maybe, you know, I'm trying to think, like in Hawaii or the Philippines, it's kind of warm. Yeah, I would just wouldn't notice it at night. Not too far, though. Yeah. I do get a little scared. Margaret, would you ever star on a reality show? <laughs> Make you a Real Housewives of L.A.? <laughs> the re no. No, no, a reality show about me would be so boring. The only person that would watch it would be Mel. Like, <laughs> I would watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're You're really hard. Hard. I, I tune in. <laughs> now, Melissa, would you ever eat octopus? I do. I eat octopus. Yeah, uh, it's a grilled, grilled octopus. Very good Italian dish. <laughs> Margaret, would you ever go skydiving? I would have said no, but I think it, I wouldn't rule it out. <laughs> well, would, it. would you ever move into a haunted house? Would I? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> that, I even sometimes get a little bit more, you know, in the East Coast, there's a lot of older houses. Yeah. Um, and it's always a little creepy to me, you know, like. You know, if the lights don't come on or they flicker or, you know, you hear like weird sounds. Yeah. yeah. Well, I always live in some form of a haunted house in general. Because mm. <laughs> I, li I like old, old houses and they're always kind of a little crappy and they mm -hmm. creep a lot. Like we're really everywhere I live. <laughs> <laughs> now, Margaret, would you ever write a retelling of Hocus Pocus? <laughs> Who can improve on that perfection? <laughs> no, I think they already did, right? There's a hocus pocus, new a hocus, novel, right? No. Uh, yeah, I'm using that as Halloween Town. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> another, another cherished classic. Yeah. Well, that concludes game time. Melissa and Margaret, I want to thank you for appearing on Book Hour and being here with us. Before I let you go, tell viewers what they can expect from you. Are you writing more books together? Yes, we are. We are working on a new uh, collaboration. I, I don't know if we can announce it yet. I don't think we've announced the title. So, All right. yeah. <laughs> we'll love it. <laughs> well, I'm very excited to see what book this will be. I'm a huge fan of both of you. Melissa, I love The Queen Assassin. And Margaret, as I told Cammie when she was on Book Hour, I love beautiful creatures. Tell viewers where they can find you on social media. Uh, Melissa-Delacruz.com and on Twitter, Melissa Delacruz. And on Instagram, author Melissa Delacruz. And Margaret? Margaret underscore Stoll is Instagram. M Stoll is Twitter. Mstoll.com. That's, you know, that's mostly it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. All the links of where to find out more on Melissa De La Cruz and Margaret Stoll are in the description below. Thank you, Melissa and Margaret, for being on Book Hour. And for those watching, I hope you have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.